That's okay. Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. Thank you. Okay, right. Let me go back. So I want to look talk about Israel's universe and the academic boycott. And what you can see on the first page here are just a collection. If you do a Google and say Jerusalem Post uh, academic boycott, this is just the first page that comes up. Uh, there are many, many more pages, and you can see that it traces, in a sense, that just a, a small amount of the many, many articles which have been op-eds, articles which have been written about boycotts generally, academic boycotts over the years, since this whole issue first came up about 15 years ago, um, in, in about 2004, 2005. It started mostly in the UK, although, as I'll show you during the course of this presentation, Actually, some of the bigger issues are from North America, not necessarily from um, England. But you can see all the different sort of things. Um, just read two or three of them at the top. Ariel University study is rejected because, well, that's a different issue, isn't it? Ariel University, that's a different issue altogether. University of Cape Town blocks academic boycott of Israel, um, combating BDS. Lo lo loads of headings about the, the boycott. And the sort of questions I want to bring up today you can see in these different headlines or titles um, uh, where um, a, does a boycott actually strengthen the Israeli right? That's an interesting question. Um, how do we combat it? We combat it by promoting scientific cooperation. Uh, do we have a self-imposed boycott? What are the realities? And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it, about what exactly is the boycott? Um, and is it really, are we making a bigger meal of it than it really is in practice? Um, and about that, there's a big debate, but that debate tends to um, fall down around what your political positions in Israel are about governments and about the territories and the occupation and so on. And although that is an interesting discussion in its own right, I don't want to go in that direction there tonight, apart from one or two very brief comments. Um, Israel's universities, let's start by saying something about Israel's universities. I'm at Ben Gurion University, one of Israel's seven major institutes of higher education. Um, although in recent years you've had both the IDC and the Ariel added to that list. Um, universities today are competing with each other in a country, competing around the world. They all want to be up the top. Every year now there are all sorts of organizations in the world who rank them along various indices based on the quality of their research, the quality of their teaching, uh, the quality of their public involvement. And these are just some of the, the four most well-known indices. You know, the university, at least once a year, the senior faculty have to have a Senate meeting where the rector, rector in Israel is a vice chancellor, or the president of the university comes and shows the rankings and says, look, we're not doing well enough, we have to improve, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's always a big debate and a big fight, particularly amongst the more senior academics and the younger ones who see the global world of science very different uh, to each other. Uh, you may say that these numbers are quite low, but actually for all of them, for all of them, they're actually quite high. Um, and I'm saying dismiss Ariel, not because of the politics, but because they're, they're very new to this list. Therefore, they're completely down the bottom. But if you can see, uh, the, Israel's top four are Tel Aviv, the Hebrew, Technion, and Weizmann. And then you have a group of three, Barilan, Haifa, Ben Gurion, who are always competing to get into that top group. Um, and actually, the, the rankings are fairly good. They used to be even better for Israeli universities. But there has been a bit of a lack of investment in Israeli universities over the last 15, 20 years, which means that some of the North American European universities are jumping over them. And of course, there's been a huge boost in Asian universities in the past 10 years, whether it be in Japan or Korea, or even some parts of China, um, with huge amounts of money being put in, mostly into technology, uh, technological research, not so much into the humanities and social sciences. But as you can see, Israel doesn't do, if I can use a British understatement, it really doesn't do that badly, particularly when you look at the top ones, Tel Aviv, Hebrew, um, and, uh, and Weizmann. So um, we're up there, and I think that's part of, you know, I'm in a sense, I'm giving you one of the answers, which I'm going to come to in half an hour, why actually the attempts to boycott Israel academically uh, don't really have much impact, because at the end of the day, 
good scientists want to do research with good scientists. That's what it really comes down to. And let's not forget that 90% of the academia are not involved or are not necessarily interested in the political issues, whether they should be or shouldn't be, is a different question altogether. And they want to find in today's world where you're competing to get the top research grants from the European Union, from the American government, you're always looking for the best people to cooperate with. Israel does exceptionally well in this international competition. Actually, pro rata, it does uh, in many of the European, for instance, research funding agencies, it does much better than Britain. Um, and Britain has its own problem now because of Brexit, they're not necessarily going to be involved in all of the, the pan-European funding. That's a big problem that British universities are facing and are going to face over the next two or three years. What exactly is an academic boycott? And so let's try um, and um, clarify what exactly an academic boycott is. Um, I made a list of all the sorts of things that could happen if you have a professor um, in England or America or somewhere else who decides, we think the Israeli government is uh, apartheid, they occupy the Palestinian territories, they um, don't uh, observe the basic laws of civil rights, all the normal arguments that you know about. And so they decide we're not going to do work with Israeli universities or academics. So they can decide not to be part of a cooperative research project. You know, you're always looking for partners. The big research projects today are looking for partners of 13, 15, 20 universities around the world. This is what the big government agencies like funding. They can decide we don't want to cooperate. We're not going to work with any Israeli colleague. They can decide not to invite Israeli academics to conferences, seminars, sabbaticals at their university. They can decide not to attend conferences held in Israel. I, every few years, put together big international meetings here in my field of geopolitics. Actually, I'm just setting up now. I've just won uh, um, uh, the tender to host the next International Conference of the Association of Borderland Studies, which is held once every four years. And they've decided that my proposal to hold it in Israel in two years time um, um, has been accepted as one the tender. There may be some people who decide not to come, but, I, but I'm not going to notice it because the amount of people who come, you don't notice the five or six that don't come. Um, they can refuse to referee papers which are submitted by Israeli academics. There have been some cases of that, which on the whole have been highlighted. And uh, usually the editorial board or the publishers have then um, stepped in and insisted that they are refereed. Um, they can decide not to contribute to a journal or a book which is being edited by an Israeli academic. They may decide not to accept uh, research students from Israel when they have say three postdoctoral grants and they have 10 applicants. It's very easy to decide not to accept the Israeli research student uh, without even saying that's the reason. Um, there have been some cases, but they uh, tend to be um, uh, more marginal where lectures by visiting Israeli academics have been disrupted. It tends to happen more with political figures or ambassadors. You may remember Ami Ayalon being, having to virtually be, have security people um, rescue him from King's College a few years ago, though King's College until recently was actually a big uh, friend of Israeli universities. Um, but then it sort of changed direction a bit. Uh, that tends to be more with politicians than with academics, but uh, it can happen. Uh, they can decide to push their local governments, particularly in North America, to disinvest in Israeli research in universities, uh, or prevent the universities from signing. So there's a whole range of activities which are under this title and which can be promoted in an attempt to promote a boycott. And at the end, I say the silent boycott, because the truth is where boycott does sometimes take place at the level of the individual, you don't really know about it because someone doesn't decide to come to a conference. But there are millions of reasons why people don't come to a conference. I'm not talking about Corona period, of course. They don't have enough resources. The university doesn't give them the leave. Um, they just, the topic doesn't interest them, whatever. I mean, they don't have to come out and say, it's very rare, although it does happen occasionally, where someone comes and says, I've had emails written to me by people who in a sense I'm friendly with in the world of geopolitics, um, and said, look, David, 
we really value your work and etc cetera, etc cetera, but i've made a decision not to come to israel because a b c d and e so but you know they don't always say it straight out there can be cases where as i've already mentioned you know there are 10 uh, students on a shortlist for two postdoctoral positions at a british on american university and without even stating it you know people can be sitting around saying when you get to the shortlist every one of the 10 is worthy I mean, that's the problem in academia today. Every position we publicize today, there are 50 applicants of whom any one of 10 are as good as each other. And a person can be sitting in the room, he may not even necessarily be anti-Israel as such. And he's saying to himself, you know what? There are 10 really good candidates here. We've got to choose two. And if I vote for one of the Israelis, I'm going to have people sending me mails and knocking on my door. And, and at the back of his mind, he doesn't even think for a minute that he's doing something wrong, but he's... Uh, influenced by what's going on and eventually that guy doesn't get the position so obviously there's a lot of individual cases the same can be with papers and so on uh, that happen as a silent boycott and that's something you can never really quantify and you don't really know the the other side to it is of course there's dean um for the six years i'm head of the promotion and the tenure committee and I'll, I'll, often people come to the committee and their file simply isn't good enough say to be promoted from lecturer to professor, because they haven't published enough. That's a big thing in the university world to publish in the world's top scientific journals. And you say, well, you really need another year or two, come back in two years time when your file is ready. And they'll turn around and say, you know, we really would have had more, but you realize that our papers haven't been accepted because of the academic boycott. I must have heard that argument 50 times when I was Dean, uh, but I think it was only true in two or three cases. Um, so obviously, you know, because it's all done silently in a sense, uh, you don't always know when and where it's going to happen. But that's what's included with an academic boycott. Uh, you can look up at what the, the academic boycott is on Wikipedia. It was launched in April 2004 in the UK. Um, and of course, a lot of the headlines, particularly in the first few years, always were coming out of the UK. But as I'll show you shortly, and I'll focus more on the UK today because I know the situation there much better. But actually, on the one or two occasions when a, a big issue of boycott has risen, it tends to be right in the United States and North America rather than UK, because that's where the really big academic and scientific associations um, are located. Um, of course, boycott is all part of the wider BDS campaign. Uh, BDS meaning boycott, disinvestment and sanctions, um, which has obviously spread around the world over, over the last 15 years. And it's not just academic, scientific related. Actually, the things that would hit Israel more if it was successful, which it isn't, um, would be, you know, banning commercial projects, uh, banning, you know, purchasing major goods from Israel or something like that, or major investment in Israel. It's just that it started with the universities and that since the universities are always perceived as being the place where there's academic freedom, where there's liberal discussion, where there's open discussion, it's in a sense taken on a much greater importance or significance than actually some of the area, other areas of BDS, um, which we hear less about, but which can be much more challenging and impact in a much uh, bigger way. Um, I'll leave that side out. And as I say, it happened in the two main areas, North America and, uh, and the UK. So two of the big cases which happened in North America was uh, back about six, seven years ago, the ASA, the American Studies Association members voted by a two to one margin to endorse the boycott of Israel's universities. There was another big thing with an organization called MESA, the Middle East Studies Association, which is also, as you can imagine, a huge number of Israeli scholars are involved in MESA, uh, Middle East research. And they also, and they're more radical, they're a bit like SOAS in, in the UK. And they also tried to push through just five years ago um, a motion. On one or two occasions, these motions passed. But unlike the UK, the American government stepped in much more so. And they made it very clear that for them, most state governments and the federal government especially made it very clear that as far as they're concerned, boycotts discriminate, whether they agree or disagree with the political positions. They're unethical, they're illegal. And they, uh, I would say they uh, made it very clear to American universities that they would face problems with federal funding if they went in that direction. And you can see just from a few examples, I took this out from many examples, just the sort of reaction that universities have had. Um, all of these reactions, without reading too many of them, um, 
uh, Fran, and I've focused on some big universities, City University of New York, Cornell, which is one of, of course, the Ivy League, uh, Johns Hopkins, another Ivy League, Northwestern, Rutgers, the big uh, New York uh, University, um, have all rejected, this came out after the ASA, the American Studies Association vote, they all came out with very strong statements from their presidents, objecting to and rejecting the academic boycott. Uh, University of California, Berkeley, which is of course considered one of the more radical universities, and nevertheless also um, uh, um, uh, came out against it. UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where many Israelis go for their research and their sabbatical, the big Texas universities and so on. They all came out against it, the presidents, because I think partly because of pressure from government and partly because many of them really felt that this was not the right way, this was unethical, this was discriminatory uh, practice and, and so on. It should be said that both in America and in England, it is the institutions that feel the need to respond. Um, it is often the individuals or the individual organizations such as one or two academic organizations like the ones I mentioned who undertake um, you know, to have their members vote for or against cooperating with Israeli universities. But the institutions as such, they've been very rare and far between where an institution has come out and say, we as an institution boycott um, Israel or any other country for that matter, because that's where it falls foul of laws of discrimination, of unequal treatment of one country and not another. And that's where the pressure has been brought to bear by those who counteract boycott um, against the institutions rather than against the individuals as such. And the institutions often insist that if an individual, a well-known individual, and there are plenty of those, uh, speaks uh, about boycotting Israel, he's not going to come to Israel, he's not going to invite Israeli research students and so on, um, they often, uh, depending on which institution, they often insist that he, in, that he make it clear that he's speaking, he or she are speaking in their personal capacity and not on the part of the institution, not out of any love or hate of Israel, but because they want to do scientific research with Israel and because, as I say, state governments come down on them very hard for such discriminatory practices. At the end of the day, given the fact there are thousands and thousands of academic associations, as of a few weeks ago, these are the total number of um, American associations which actually have a boycott motion which has passed and which has not yet been, been rescinded. And you can see, and there are no other pages to this. It's not as though I'm taking one page. That's what there is at the moment. So you can see it's uh, a lot more headlines than it is necessarily um, practice as such. Um, we move from the USA to the UK where this whole business started. I would say there were two main periods. Um, it started at, with the U University Teachers, UAT, the University Association of Teachers in 2005, from 2004 to 2006. That's when I represented the universities in Britain and where we went down at the time to the main meetings and, uh, and spoke with people and so on. And then again, about in, the, in about four or five years ago, it came up again. Um, the UCU and then the, UAC, the UAT amalgamated with another teachers union, I think became known as the UCU or something like that. I can't remember all the initials, but there were quite a number of situations in Israel, in the UK, where they tried to promote um, a boycott resolution of Israeli academia. Um, the teachers, university teachers, session brought up year after year after year because it was the same small clique of people who were uh, interested in university politics. Most of the, the good scientists actually don't have time and are not interested in these uh, unions. Um, and so it's the same small group of people, number of Jews amongst them, no surprise, I'm sure, um, who promoted it year after year. The big headlines came when there was an issue at uh, the BRISMES, the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies, particularly at SOAS, which is where I actually studied some of my undergraduate degree back in the 70s. But there was a big, um, uh, there was quite a, a violent, uh, both physical and verbal against Israeli and Jewish students. And of course, there was the famous case of Stephen Hawking and so on. So in Britain, it became more of a headline than anywhere else. 
you had a number of very nice people like Hillary and Stephen Rose um, writing why we should boycott, break up the British research, um, whatever it is, brought out a whole book on why. It's funny, it says why boycott Israeli universities, but actually the, the, the whole pamphlet is about why we should boycott Israeli universities, but that doesn't appear in the title as such. So there was a lot of publication going on for and against the issue of the boycotts. Again, like the American universities, UK universities came out very strongly. I don't know if any of you know what the Russell Group is. The Russell Group are the 20 top universities in Britain, a bit like the Ivy League in America. They include Cambridge and Oxford and uh, Bristol and London and Edinburgh and Durham, the top universities. Um, and uh, at the time, the Russell Group, this is going back to 2007, came out very strongly uh, against the attempts to boycott Israel. At the time, we brought the first then delegation of Israeli vice chancellors uh, to Israel since when they've been coming every few years or so on. It was very interesting that the person who took over from Malcolm Grant was actually the principal of King's College, whose name escapes me for the moment. He's not there anymore. And he was really against the boycott, very strongly, not just because the government were pressing, but because he really believed this was an unethical thing. And we sat down afterwards and analyzed and decided it was because he was American. Uh, but th that's why, you know, he didn't have some of these hangups about it. But uh, again, as I say, even Exeter, which is not known as the, the, the most comfortable university for Israeli students to be at, they also came out uh, um, against uh, all attempts to boycott. Um, you know what BICOM is? BICOM is the British Israel um, uh, lobby uh, in, in Israel. I wouldn't quite say it's APAC, but it's developed very nicely in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, they wrote a booklet about the campaign and they had a very significant article by Michael Yudkin from Oxford about uh, he really went into it and looked at the untruths of many of the statements which were being made. Outside the UK and the USA, other countries, my own university had a very major issue going back about 10 years, eight years, where to say that 2011, when a major South African university decided to severe, uh, sever ties with uh, Ben Gurion University, over its water research, which of course, which was the most illogical thing they could do because Israel was providing the R&D to South Africa to improve water quality, to improve the, um, uh, the supply of water in arid areas, you know, and to, to prevent po poverty and to prevent hunger. And here was a South African university coming saying, we're going to break off ties. And that caused actually quite a major fuss at the time um, I'm not, to be, to be honest with you, I think it's back on today, but I think on the whole Ben Gurion University basically turned around and said, you don't want to, it's your loss, we've got plenty of other universities in the third world who want the expertise that we have uh, for these countries. There are, of course, the question of Israeli academics who support academic boycotts. Um, they're all over the place. One of them was one of my closest colleagues, Professor Niv Gordon from Department of Politics, Ben Gurion University. He's now in the Department of Law at Queen Mary College in London. And actually there's been a bit of a movement in the last few years of a number of these people from positions in Israel to positions in America and the UK. And we're waiting to see where, how involved they're going to get in, again in the pro boycott uh, positions. Many of them have went because they're fed up with the conflict. They just don't want to be around. So not all of them are going to get involved, but of course it never helps the case if I can use a British understatement, when you have an Israeli academic, um, uh, Jewish academic, as was the case in the UCU, uh, the, the Rose family and so on, um, who are promoting boycott. And I'm not making any comment about what their political persuasions are. I myself am fairly left of center and the left divides down those who are left of center and say, oh, we've got a boycott, promote boycott. And I think it's, uh, and those who say, look, we're left of center, we're part of a democracy, we need to change the government not going to happen very quickly here in Israel, certainly not between right and left. I'm not saying not between Bibi and maybe other leaders, but there's no real left opposition today in Israel. But that's one way of dealing with political positions you don't agree with. Another is actually obviously to come out and um, actively promote the boycott of Israel becomes even more problematic when you're an Israeli academic employed by an Israeli university, because you're basically coming and saying, boycott the institution from which I receive my wage every month. 
which is why I must admit some have been more honest and said, look, as long as I'm employed by an Israeli university, I may, you know, privately hold those positions, but it's not my, not my right to do so. I should really resign to do so. I haven't seen any who have done that, but some obviously have got up and left and gone to positions um, elsewhere. But it uh, it doesn't help to say the least when you have uh, Israeli academics who support the issue. Again, it's a minority of a minority, but of course these are the things that have more impact and have more influence. Um, there are a number of right-wing organizations. My only political point I make here, um, uh, if, if I can be extremely polite, I do not like these organizations, particularly in Tiritsu and the Israel Academia Monitor. They tend to have uh, adopted a witch campaign against any left-wing Israeli academics, but obviously anyone who supports boycott. I personally think at least the first two, not necessarily the NGO monitor of Professor Gerald Steinberg, but certainly the first two, my argument is they do much more harm to Israel's academia than they do good. And that's the one political comment I'm going to make about there this year. Um, and we can leave that to a discussion later on. There have been many differing discussions in, in uh, the press. Uh, in 2015 and 16, I wrote quite a bit about it. Um, I wrote three or four pieces when I was writing op-eds for the uh, Jerusalem Post. And I entitled one of the articles that, you know, we're into a boycott paranoia. Look around and see what's happening in Israeli academia and Israeli science. And the boycott has no impact, but we're making it into a much bigger thing than it is. And maybe we are making the headlines, which allow the other side to think they're succeeding and to have their own headlines. And we should deal with it in a different way. And of course, that created a huge debate, a very heated debate. Um, not all of my colleagues necessarily agreed with me. And I wrote a number of pieces along that line at that time. Um, academics have to publish and to publish. Uh, and so the boycott itself around the whole issue of academic freedom um, and scientific freedom, um, the politics of academia, which I hope I've got a lot of material. I'm trying to, with all my other interests in geopolitics and Anglo jury, I'd really like to write a book about the politics of academia, but it's not coming on at the moment. So you have people who, of course, are getting their own promotion, in a sense, by writing serious academic stuff about the boycott. One of the best known is a guy called Corey Nelson, the first and last book here. He's a big defender of Israeli universities. He was a major player in the United States, a professor of English literature, um, who was very involved in the, um, the whole issue of ethics in academia and so on. And he was very helpful to Israel in lecturing and writing books about it. Um, another one, Conflict Over Conflict, but of course you also have books on the other side, such as Against Apartheid, The Case for Boycotting Israeli Universities. So it's become a big industry in its own right. You know, you, um, depending whether you're writing newspaper op-eds or serious academic papers, I'll just give you a very brief taste of these things. Look at all these journals, the um, uh, AAUP Journal of Academic Freedom, Carrie Nelson, the person I just mentioned, uh, two of the right-wing um, uh, defenders, um, such as Manfred Gerstenfeld or Martin Kramer in Israel Affairs, um, who have come out very strongly, obviously, against uh, the boycott. I've chosen papers that come out against the boycott rather than those that attack Israeli academics uh, for their left-wing views. There are plenty of those as well, but as I say, that's not part of the discussion here tonight. Um, I've published my own research on the boycott um, and Kenneth Stern. So, as I say, it's become an industry in its own right, um, publishing, putting it within the wider context of academic boycotts, comparing it to South Africa. There are many who say, well, the, the boycott worked against South Africa. Um, you know, that's what we should do here. But actually, for two reasons, there's absolutely no comparison to make. One, because what happened in South Africa is that it basically... Um, prevented liberal anti-apartheid academics from working within South African universities. So um, where you have in Israel, you have different influences within universities from the left and the right. Um, in South Africa, most of the left of center liberal academics had to simply get up and leave because it was impossible uh, to, to work there. And the, the boycotters didn't exactly uh, help them. And at the end of the day, it wasn't the academic boycott, the top of the apartheid regime. It was an economic boycott. And for those of you, I don't know what happened in the States at the time, but those of us in England at the time know how influential the sporting boycott was. When Basil Dolivera wasn't allowed to play cricket for England in South Africa, 
that had a far greater impact. Now, I shouldn't really admit this, but that obviously had a far greater impact than all of the universities put put, put together. Um, so uh, the sporting and the uh, and the the financial program, and of course the other fact being that the whole of the world united against apartheid, and as we know very well here, that it's a minority of institutions or governments that uh, particularly even more so in recent months because of the peace agreement with so many Arab nations in the Middle East, which I'll come to at the end of this. Um, so, you know, a boycott works when everybody boycotts, but when only about 2% boycott and there are always people ready to fill in their places, it doesn't have a huge impact in any way. So what do we do to counter the boycott? Um, I mean, okay, I'll, five to 10 minutes and I'll stop, I promise you. What do we do to counter the boycott? First of all, we carry on as usual. We do our work. We do our scientific work. We promote scientific cooperation. Um, as those of you who read the advert for tonight may have noticed those unusual three letters I added onto my name of the OBE. I've got no idea to this day why I really got it, but I was told it was because I promote, promoted scientific cooperation between the UK and, um, and Israel. So it's nothing like promoting scientific cooperation. We invite academics. We give lectures at universities. We continue our usual work. And one of the main things that I've always been involved in with my colleagues, especially with regards to the UK, um, because everybody knows that I'm from Britain. I like going to Britain and being there. And I know my way around the university world in Britain. A lot of people come to me and say, you know, David, the atmosphere is so bad at the British universities. I was going to go to King's College or wherever to do my sabbatical, but I think I'm going to go to America instead um, because it's, uh, it's better there. Now, one good reason for not going to the UK is they don't offer you good money. America does. Um, but uh, one of my biggest uh, involvements in, in when I was here as dean was to say to people, no, you must go. Because first of all, in the whole, the academics greet you as academics. You may find one or two people who don't want to talk to you, don't want to sit with you for coffee, but 95% of people want to do work with you and they're going to greet you very nicely when you come and they're going to help you settle in um, and so on. And if you don't go, what you're doing is you are giving the other side a victory by having a self-imposed boycott. They haven't been able to prevent you coming. Their university is prepared to have you. And you, because you're not sure about the atmosphere, they aren't prepared to go to. And in a sense, the boycott is happening through your decision not to go. And that, of course, is very important. And we don't uh, uh, have a self-imposed boycott and so on. Um, Israel created a Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Public Diplomacy some years ago. Um, there's a lot of discussion as to what this is really about. It's not only about academic, it's about the, uh, fighting boycotts and anti-Semitism generally. You'll notice that's the first time I used the word anti-Semitism in the whole lecture. Um, um, and obviously there's a lot of it involved, but that's not the real issue here. Um, there are a lot of people who say this is a ministry created jobs for the boys, uh, lots of money pouring into certain organizations. And again, there's a big debate as to whether that really had an impact or didn't have an impact on fighting. Well, particularly, and here I will make a little comment, is it tends to only fund right of center agencies, although that's not surprising given the fact that we have right of center governments in Israel. Uh, that's a democratic reality as to what's happening in Israel to, today. Um, the INSS, um, the International Institute for National Security Studies, very well reputed um, uh, research organization affiliated to Tel Aviv University, um, also took the line that I follow, which is who's afraid of BDS. And they basically argue, as I'm arguing here, that you have to deal with it. You can't remain silent. It's not what I'm saying. But at the same time, you have to put it in its right perspective. And you have to know that by promoting scientific cooperation, that is the best way of fighting boycotts. The fact that we could turn around after a few years to the UK, uh, to the Union teachers in England say, you know, when you started your boycott campaign, you had, I don't know, let's just throw a number out. You had, let's say, 100 cooperation agreements with Israel. And now because you've pushed us into it, we now have 120 cooperation agreements. Well, that's the impact of your boycott. Thank you very much. Um, and then there are two main or three main areas in the world where Israel does a huge amount of scientific cooperation. One is with America. Uh, the big, the U.S. Embassy, the BSF, is the, the U.S. Israel Binational Science Foundation. They are some of the largest. I mean, these are multi, multi-million 
research grants in technology, in medicine, um, also in the social sciences and humanities, but less so. And Israel is very involved. Every few months we get emails from our research authority in the university. You know, you haven't applied for a BCF in three years. Why not? Can we help you find partners so that we can get another BSF project? So obviously Israel America research is very important. Um, there are a huge number of bilateral programs of European countries. That is going to change with respect to Britain now. Britain, don't get me going on Brexit, but um, um, Britain has really lost out in the academic field because a lot of the European research funding agencies now will not be including Britain or they may have a different status. Um, I've been involved in a lot of European funded research as an Israeli academic, but I've often had British partners um, uh, work it out. It's a good way for me to have reasons to go to London to do research and to make sure that my lecture or research is on the same day as an event taking place in N17. Work it out. Um, and um, and um, the I'll come to in a minute, what we call the Horizon programs are huge, or they used to call, call the FB, are where people from 16, 17 universities get together. The main EU countries with affiliate countries, Israel is an affiliate of the um, European Union. They now have better status in some of these programs than Britain will have over the next few years. And actually, literally a year ago, I was sitting in King's College with a colleague of mine who I do a lot of research with, and we were talking about a new FP or Horizon program and putting a proposal together. And we were discussing, and he said to me, he says, you know, I don't know if I can apply anymore. He says, you as an Israeli are preferred in the European programs now than I as a British academic. Um, and that's a lot of that still got to be worked out over the next few years, but some of it has already started to kick in, including the Erasmus program, which are students exchanges, where many Israeli students have traveled to European universities. Many European students have come to Israeli universities, um, and Britain's now not part of that scheme um, anymore. Israel has an amazing, oh, well, I'll come to that in a second. I've got a slide about it. So um, as you can see, there are, if you look at, there's the government of the UK, there's Switzerland here, there's Germany. Germany and Israel have very strong scientific relations, probably the biggest single country in the EU. Um, they have lots of separate foundations, the Adenauer Stiftung, the Ebert Stiftung, the Heinz Boll Stiftung, representing political parties in Germany, who all fund their own research cooperation. And as you can imagine, when they're because of budgets, they're pulling out of other countries in the world, they don't pull out of Israel for obvious historical, emotional reasons. Um, uh, they don't want to be accused of you know, leaving Israel in the lurch. So there's a lot of very major scientific research with good German universities, Switzerland, um, and, and so on. So all of these European countries. Horizon 2020 is the major European framework program. Look at the amounts of money we're talking about, 80 billion of funding available research and innovation over seven years from 2014 to 2020. And the next generation of projects are now starting, as I say, without Britain, but um, they're starting. Israelis are very involved in these projects. I've been part of European consortium looking at border issues with 16, 17 other European universities on a number of a uh, on a number of occasions. And Israel actually has some of the best success rate. Now, every country who's part of this research program has to put in a certain amount, so many millions every year. And depending on academic excellence, because all of these proposals are undergo a whole process of scientific judgment and, eva and evaluation and a first round and a second round, Israel takes out of the Horizon project far more than it puts in. And that is for one reason only, because of its scientific excellence, for no other reason uh, what, whatsoever. Um, at the time when there was a lot of tension between Israel and the EU and this, this strategic ministry came up and said, well, we're going to withdraw from all European funding. We don't need them. And the heads of the universities in Israel were in Jerusalem the next day with the prime minister saying, you make sure that we stay within Horizon because this is the most important, one of the most important sources of funding scientific research. These are just the, uh, these are from a number of years. You don't have to read it, but they're from five different years. These are the lists of Israelis or Israeli institutions or academics who have won research awards from Horizon I mean, any one year. So you can see just a huge amount of success Israeli academics have in, in this area. 
Last few years, China, India, Korea, which I don't have on this list, have become a major um, source of uh, cooperation. I spent the first few months in 2019 as a visiting professor in Delhi at the South Asian University working really fascinating with 17 doctoral students from all over South Asia from seven or eight countries and learning about their border problems and their geopolitical problems, which I can assure you are no um, less confusing than our own ones. Um, really fascinating. They wanted to learn from me about Israel, about Europe, and I wanted to learn from them about Asia. And they, on the whole, welcome Israeli academics, um, R&D, um, and now, as I say, China and Korea are very big, and it's mostly in technology, less so in social sciences and humanities. One of the big things that resulted, that came about as a result of the British attempts, was a project called BIRAX. Um, BIRAX is the Britain-Israel Research Britain Israel Research and Academic Exchange Partnership. When the boycott issue started in Britain, so uh, Israel decided to, uh, in a positive way, exploit the situation. And they pressed the British government to open up a new project. Now, on the whole, the individual governments in Europe don't fund research projects. They put it all into the European Coupa, and it all comes out of Europe. But because all of this um, headlines were coming out of Britain, I was there involved at the time. And uh, the person who really pushed it was Sir Trevor Chin. I remember sitting with him in his office in Marble Arch and deciding how can we push this ahead? And we got some funding from England, some funding from Israel, and we got the foreign ministries to uh, promote these joint projects. I came out of it after a while because they decided only to go in the, again in the fields of technology and then water, and now I think they've gone into the areas of aging and gerontology, um, partly because they didn't want to get involved in political areas and issues. And although, of course, I, in a sense, lost out from that, it made a lot of sense uh, to do it. And, uh, and uh, Trevor Chin, the way he puts people and organizations together, um, I had a good lesson in um, public philanthropy. But Birax is now on the table. It came about because of the boycott because pressure was put on, the idea came up, and they and we more or less said, let's make sure they can't say no, because if they say no, we're going to sort of hint, well, you're falling for the boycott. And in the end, so um, although the, the funding here isn't huge, nevertheless, the fact that it was publicly promoted and still is today by the British government through the British Council and through Israel is, of course, very important. Last comments I want to make. Oh, so. Sorry, one more. There's the Academic Friends of Israel. I don't know if any of you, sons of United Synagogue Ministers, Elkin, John Levy, the son of Isaac Levy, um, for 30 years has been running the Academic oh. Study Group. Um, he raises his own funds. He puts together small groups of academics every year who have some sort of pre-meetings. They get to know each other for the first time. Mostly they visit Israel on a few occasions. The Israelis visit England. And they use the time together to put in bigger research proposals over a period of over 20 years, uh, maybe 30 years. Every year he has five or six groups, including about seven to 10 British academics, work that out. That's every year about 40 British academics over 20, 30 years. That's nearly a thousand very senior British academics who have begun to do research with their Israeli colleagues because of this tremendous program of the academic study group. And finally, I've got to say something. Oh, um, well, that was just a bit of self-promo. Because every university, I could have taken any university here. I took my own one, but the same is true of every university in Israel. We all are part of Erasmus. Um, we have an MBA international program. We have a Columbia Medical School program. We have the Research Institute of Israel. Every university in Israel is very much on the international stage today. It has lots of international programs, not only or the boycott issue is very marginal. Today, the name of the game in world academia is internationalization. If you're not part of internationalization in academia and scientific exchange, you're simply not there. And all of Israel's universities are very into it. Um, and of course, the last few months, a whole load of new opportunities have, have opened up. Why did Israel and the UAE and Morocco and, uh, and uh, Dubai uh, come together? Again, not because of any love, but because we have a common enemy in Iran, um, there's a frustration in the Arab world with the Palestinian leadership. 
Israel, as has already been proved, is the back door for many of these countries into the USA, or it certainly was as long as Trump was there. And they're already linking in into Israel's R&D. So just within the last four months, look at this. Israel Arab Peace Accord fuels hope for scientific cooperation. Education instates to, to cooperate. A Weizmann Institute of, Sci of Science sign cooperation accord. Um, I'm not going to say it's one way, but on the whole, on the whole, Israel has the expertise. Uh, the Gulf states have the checkbooks or whatever, or the credit cards today. Um, but nevertheless, everybody's benefiting from it. And this is obviously going to be a whole new area of academic cooperation. In order to summarize, what I would say is there are clearly some nasty people and organizations out there. Um, some of them are down and out anti-Semites. Some of them make the distinction they're very anti-Israel. And I think in many cases you can make that distinction. That's a whole nother argument. But despite all the headlines and everything that is there, it's been combated fairly well. And the main way it's been combated is by us doing our work here, promoting scientific cooperation. We have top universities. Um, people want to do academic work with us. Maybe it would be more of a problem if we weren't good universities, but we are. Um, we have some of the world's top scientists in most fields, certainly in um, medicine, in technology and so on. And uh, Israel uh, doesn't like, we don't like the headlines. We don't, we try and combat them as much as we can, but thank God we're doing pretty well as a scientific community. Thank you.